Hello, everyone, and welcome to Knowledge Espresso. If you don't know me yet, my name is Ellie Young. I'm head of community at the Knowledge Graph Conference. And my guest today is Moham Arif, who is the CEO of Relational AI. And he's here to tell us about how relational is the future of graphs, which is a very interesting claim that I am very curious to hear more about. So Moham, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you see relational as the future. Okay, thank you, Ellie. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, I, uh, a little bit about myself. I'm um, an engineer by education. I've been working in uh, machine learning and AI, uh, you know, as a, in the enterprise setting for about 30 years uh, before it was called machine learning. Uh, it was in the, in the early 90s, we sometimes refer to it as computational intelligence or data mining or database mining and, and, and so on. Um, I'm the CEO of a company called Relational AI. We are about 85 people. We're pre-launch, uh, but we have a um, handful of uh, very important clients who lead um, you know, their respective industries in telecommunications, in tax and audit, in financial services, in retail, and so on. And uh, my point of view, though, what I want to share today is based uh, on you know, 30 years of experience and watching the industry evolve. Um, and maybe, Ali, I can start with sort of some observations about that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to hear your perspective. Okay. So, you know, today's sort of modern data stack uh, has uh, s several components. There are sort of the operational systems, uh, the uh, OLTP systems, if you will, uh, typically applications like uh, uh, NetSuite or Workday or uh, Salesforce or homegrown applications where business logic is typically written in a procedural language like Java or C Sharp and the data is modeled uh, relationally in SQL. Okay, and Then you have a, a pipeline technology of some sort to take the data out of those systems and to put it in uh, the historical uh, uh, data management solutions. And um, today, you know, a system like... Uh, like Fivetran would be really good at sort of doing that transformation and that those systems like that are uh, declarative relational uh, in nature as well. And you typically put these systems in um, uh, data management solutions for data warehouses, data lakes, et cetera. Uh, and recently those have become relational with Snowflake leading the way uh, and um, uh, you manage, you know, data transformation now uh, inside the database. Uh, unlike a few years ago when you managed it outside in Hadoop and, 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 and so on with the systems like dbt and so on. So these first three layers are uh, 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 relational or mostly relational or founded on a relational data management technology. But the last layer, the predictive layer, uh, is, isn't yet uh, relational. You have technologies like uh, graph technologies that are navigational or you have pointers chasing uh, you know, chasing uh, data around. You have uh, data frame-based technology like Spark. You have data flow-based technology like Spark and so on. Uh, you, uh, you have machine learning technology based on tensors and data frames. So you have a hodgepodge of uh, data flow or navigational or tensor-based technologies in that mix. And um, just from observing, you know, how the industry evolved over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, I think there's a really good argument to be made that those workloads will become relational in the not too distant future. Does that make sense? It's, well, I mean, that's definitely, yes, that's a good foundation to the claim. And now, of course, I want to ask you how, like, do you have a, a, a yeah. perspective on why that would become relational just because everyone's made that investment or, you know, something more specific? Yeah. Yep, I'd love to tell you. So, so let's start with, again, a little bit more of the history lesson here and like how did this happen for um, OLTP or transactional workloads? So in the, in, the, uh, in the 70s and 80s, when the relational model was first invented, uh, it was seen as academic. It was seen as something that's not going to be uh, practical or pragmatic, that you know, real uh, uh, IT folks would use a navigational uh, database technology that from companies like IBM and GE and Honeywell, uh, systems that were based on something called Codasil. Uh, I think the CO and Codasil stood for COBOL, I think. But, uh, but anyways, it was a navigational database technology. And when relational it, it came around, everyone thought it was a gimmick. Uh, and in fact, in 1974, there was an event called the Great Debate, the Great Database Debate between two guys. Uh, one was Charles Bachman, who at the time was a Turing Award winner, and he was responsible for building the world's most dominant navigational database system. And the other at the time was this little known fellow, his name is Ted Codd, 
who was a researcher at IBM, and they got together with a group of uh, database technologists and sort of they duped it out. And Charles was was telling everyone, "Hey, uh, you know this not this this um, relational stuff is uh, too academic. You can't get the performance because what could be faster than going from you know um, chasing a pointer around? You know, going from a particular record uh, to another record by by following a pointer." And then his other argument was, "Well, programmers don't get this relational stuff. They really want to be able to write uh, code." Okay, and Ted was saying. Uh, uh, well, actually, in the relational model, you can separate the what from the how, and when you do that, you can let the computer help you um, get performance, and plus, we shouldn't be that worried about programmers and what programmers think. We really should be thinking about end users, analysts, uh, what today we might call data scientists, business people, and uh, giving them a, a database technology where they can just ask their questions, and then the system figures out uh, how to do it. Okay, and so you can ask, okay, well, who won that? Uh, of course, today we know who won that. Uh, you know, Oracle won that. Uh, so Oracle was, before it was called Oracle, it was actually called uh, Relational Software Inc. Uh, at the time, you had companies like Ingress, or before it was called Ingress, it was called Relational Technologies Inc. Or Informix, uh, before it was called Informix, it was called Relational Databases Inc. Okay, and if you look at Oracle's market cap today, it's 250 billion. And really, no one talks about uh, navigational OLTP databases anymore. Okay, so that's that's sort of example number one. Example number two is from the 90s. Okay, we used to, um, you know, have a debate about how analytical systems should be built. Uh, and at the time, the incumbents were uh, based on multidimensional arrays or what we would call tensors today. And so, uh, and the, again, same argument. Well, you can never get these database relational systems to perform. You know what's faster than an array? Uh, every you know you know that's how you get performance. You know, quit wasting our time with this relational uh, stuff. It doesn't make uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, go away. And again, today we look back and we say, who won? Well, we know who won. Uh, Teradata won uh, at the time, and, and systems based on the relational model. Um, and and more recently, we had a company called Tableau actually did very well in this space. And Tableau didn't have relational in its name, but it has Tableau, which is French for table. Uh, so it, it evokes the same uh, the same kind of thing. And, and today, if you ask, you know, who are the multidimensional array uh, analytics vendors, they just don't exist. Uh, or if they exist, they're very, very legacy and no one, no one buys them. Okay, so that's example two. Example three is even more recent, just happened in the last couple of years. If you, uh, all of us, I'm sure, in the last 10 years have, uh, uh, been exposed to the Hadoop hype. So uh, Hadoop, Hadoop, everything is Hadoop. Uh, MapReduce, you know, uh, is the way to go. If you have big data, you need Hadoop. Uh, uh, this relational paradigm doesn't work for big data. You really need to switch to the state of flow MapReduce paradigm. And, uh, you know, in 2012, there were, I think, uh, 50, 60 companies that were funded to do analytics on top of Hadoop. And uh, there was one company trying to do it on, uh, on SQL. And that company was called Snowflake. And as recently as 2016, Snowflake got turned down for funding, uh, I think 26 times, 27 times before they finally got funded. And uh, last year, they had the biggest software IPO of all time. And, you know, where is Hadoop? I think it's hanging out with COBOL somewhere. It's clearly become legacy and it's not really that interesting. And, uh, and the other sort of uh, MapReduce based systems to Spark is like disowning its, uh, its MapReduce heritage. It used to be, they used to position as, you know, we're a better uh, implementation of MapReduce. We're in memory, we're hundred times faster. And now all you hear from Spark is SQL, 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 SQL. And, you know, they want to hang out with the cool kids like Snowflake and, uh, and BigQuery, okay? So really, the, the, if you just pay attention, relational always wins, okay? Uh, now, it, why? You, your question, Ellie, is very important. Why does it win, okay? I think it wins because it separates the what from the how, okay? The what you want versus how you want to get it done, okay? You're dealing with uh, conceptual versus the physical. You're dealing with a model not code, okay? It automates away really hard things like query optimization or memory management, memory managing data across sort of the disk hierarchy or parallelization or acceleration or really importantly, things like concurrency and, and uh, being able to handle multiple users at the same time or more recently, incrementalization and liveness. Basically, by doing that, it, aut it automates away programming, okay? It's kind of a form 
if you will, uh, kind of it's like automatic programming or an AI for programming that gets you to be able to do much more with much less. Okay, so that's why it wins. And that's why, you know, it, there's a period of time when people go, no, it's never going to work. It's too hard. It's never going to work. We need to program all these things. And then all of a sudden, people, uh, computer scientists make it work by inventing new data structures or inventing new algorithms or inventing uh, 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 new languages uh, to make it work. Okay. And, and that's really the, the pattern that we've observed here is it's, it's never uh, what people start off with, like when you have a new workload like OLTP or OLAP or big data, <clears throat> it doesn't work for that because we haven't invented the algorithms and data structures in the languages. And then people invent stuff like for OLTP, we invented SQL, we invented uh, joins and, and, and so on. For OLAP, we invented bitmap indices and, and vectorization. For big data, we invented an architecture that separates storage from compute and we invented ways of enhancing SQL so it can deal with uh, JSON data. And you know, and then it just takes over, and it takes over um, seemingly overnight, and we quickly forget what what came before it because you know uh, PTSD or trauma or something, or we don't have, we don't want to remember what we had to live with. Okay, so does that make sense? Does I hope that yeah. Uh, yeah. So basically, what you're saying is that relational is a is a profoundly um, stable system because of the way that I mean, because of its foundational elements, and. Yeah. While there are always new technologies and new approaches that develop in time, right? At the, at the beginning of the wave, we see that and we go, we're going to abandon everything for this new ship. But in time, what ends up happening is, is rather that a, a trends, a, um, a, a link is made between the relational pre-existing system and, and the new uh, approach. Yeah. So, and I think that's a really, uh, you know, historically you, you have the proof and that's a really good point because while we, we do hear often about how graph and, and relational are at odds. Um, you know, you, you, your critique is is that we're just at the beginning of this moment. So, yeah. my question to you is, you know, how do you see graphs fitting into into this space? Okay, so let's so we we uh, you know relationally uh, we build what's called a knowledge graph management system. So let's talk about graphs and let's talk about knowledge for a second. Let's talk about how we map uh, graphs into the relational context. Okay, so if you pick up, you know. Uh, the literature from a company that sells a navigational graph system, they'll tell you, well, you know, it's really hard to do graphs in SQL. And they're not wrong, by the way, because they're trying to do graphs in SQL built for OLTP or for OLAP. And those systems are not designed for graphs, right? Because those systems don't benefit from modern uh, algorithms and data structures, okay? And they'll say, well, the solution to this is to go back to navigational, to go back 40 years and to have a data structures where each node in the graph uh, uh, has a pointer to all the nodes that are next to it. It's called an adjacency list, uh, the data structure, okay? And so it's pointer based. And uh, on the surface, that seems to make sense because now if I wanted to, I'm you know, looking at my LinkedIn profile and I wanna find out all the people that are connected to me, then I just have a pointer from me to everyone that follows me on LinkedIn or I'm connected to on LinkedIn, okay? Uh, ironically, they still talk about having relationships, nodes and relationships. And you know the prefix of relationship is relation. Uh, the other way that people try to uh, represent uh, graphs today, there's some new companies that are trying to do this this way, is uh, with matrices using linear algebra. And so they represent sort of the, the adjacency, they call it the adjacency matrix, which is like you might have uh, the rows represent uh, the nodes and the columns represent the other nodes. And if you have a value uh, at the intersection of these two nodes, that means there's a connection, okay? But the third way, the obvious way, the most obvious way is that because you're modeling a relationship, you would use a relation. You would have an edge relation. You would have, for example, uh, uh, Malham is speaking at a knowledge espresso. You have a concept of a knowledge espresso, an event. You have a concept of a person and, you, and speaking at uh, is the relation uh, that uh, represents that, uh, that edge. Or uh, Malham is uh, friends with Ben. Uh, and again, we would have a friendship uh, uh, relation. So what that means, though, is that our relational databases now have to be normalized to a much higher degree than we're used to having them be normalized because now all our tables are very skinny. You have this, these tables that might have a connection between two nodes as a binary uh, tables, tables with two columns, basically. Okay. The cool thing about that, though, is I know we don't talk about that often in the concepts of graphs, is you can model hypergraphs. Hypergraph 
is a graph system that lets you represent an edge between three things. So Malham is speaking at the KG uh, Espresso on uh, Thursday, July, uh, July 22nd. So now I'm connecting a date with a person, with an event, and with an edge that basically spans all those three uh, nodes. Okay, so the representation of a graph relationally is extremely natural. And what you're doing there is you're not talking about pointers or anything like that. You're just saying, you know, these things have a relationship between them. And, and the beautiful thing about the models underneath the covers, you can have an index that, for example, can say, you know, uh, this person is friends with this other person. So you have a source and a destination, you know, uh, and you'd have an index that would sort by the source and he'd keep all the, the friends or all the, the, yeah, all the friends next to uh, that each person, right? And so if you have, use a hash map or use something, you can jump to a particular person quickly and then immediately in that index, you find all the people they're connected to. But if later you decide, I actually wanna go in the other direction, I wanna know, uh, uh, you know uh, from the destination to the source, I just build another index or the system builds another index and it inverts that. And I can keep track underneath the covers without anybody having to be aware of pointers or whatever the data structure is that there's that connection, okay? So that's a, um, you know, uh, that's kind of like the obvious representation. And unfortunately, when people try to do this on SQL databases that were designed for bookkeeping, uh, you couldn't, um, you didn't have the right join algorithms to join together lots and lots of these skinny tables, these tables that might have two or three columns in them. And because joins are very expensive in those systems, you have very bad performance and it brought back this idea that we need to go back to the 70s and 60s and use navigational systems okay so uh, i want to i want to also if you if you'd let me also talk about uh, knowledge because it's a knowledge graph so we know how to represent graphs graphs relationally with knowledge it's the same thing uh, the beauty of, of the relational model is it has well-defined semantics you know you know what the meaning of things are in terms of mathematics and, 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 and so on. And so the knowledge is also represented really nicely in a relational paradigm where you can say something like, uh, you know, a particular product has a brand and it can only have one brand, okay? It can't have two brands, for example, or, uh, you know, a person can have two biological parents. Uh, and you take all this knowledge that you know about the world, about your business, about how things work, and you just encode it just as um, queries, relational queries in a straightforward way so that the system knows uh, what you mean and it knows you know, the, the, the underlying, uh, you know, the knowledge that you're trying to model. And between having a relational model of the knowledge and a relational representation of the graph that's very high performance because it's based on modern joint algorithms where they're not so expensive uh, and, this, and this modern query optimization and all of that, you get something that's really, really cool that simplifies uh, things tremendously. So I'm, I'm just, I mean, this is so interesting because, you know, it makes sense. And yet it's obviously a, a new perspective or at least around these parts it is. Um, so, you know, so there's, there's two kinds of things that are coming to mind and I'll ask you the first thing first. So you just mentioned that joins are expensive, right? And of course, if we're talking about tiny tables and, you know, more joins, um, how do we, well, where do you see the performance of figuring into this? Yeah. So let's let me try to give you some intuition there. So normally, um, the most expensive thing in a SQL relational database are the joins, as you just said, and I, I said as well. So, and the normal intuition is if I have a query that has more joins in it, it just runs slower. Because if I, let's say I'm joining together 10 things, and then each, uh, let's say 10 tables, you know, table one through table 10. So I might take any two of them and join them together, produce a temporary result, and then take uh, that temporary result, join it with another one, and then produce another temporary result, and join it with another one, and so on. And so uh, I'm doing uh, nine different operations, and each pair of joins can produce a lot of data, even though the final answer doesn't have any data in it or has very little data in it. Okay, because when you after you've joined the other ten things, the, the the chances of something matching everything in every every table are lower, and so you can imagine you'd have sort of a an answer that's much smaller than any one of the tables. Okay, so yeah. that's the that's the intuition that uh, people have around joins from you know 30, 40 years of us doing uh, relational databases. Now, my colleagues have invented a new kind of join algorithm. 
uh, called the worst case optimal join algorithm. I don't want to get too uh, propeller heady here. But the, the cool thing about that algorithm, the new algorithm, is the more things you add to the join, the faster it goes, not the slower. Okay, it has the potential to go faster. It might be the same uh, or faster. And the idea being is instead of looking at the two, any two tables at once and trying to do a join between any two tables, you look at them all simultaneously. Okay, and if you're looking at a record in one of them, you say, okay, is there any match uh, for uh, this record in any of the other nine? And if there isn't, okay, you can skip over uh, uh, basically until you find the record in the, 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 in the next sort of the most sparse or the most empty one. And so what you end up doing is just, you know, just working through the data and just skipping over most of the data in most of the tables. And uh, you end up getting your answer much faster by doing all the joins simultaneously. Okay, so let's say we're we're in a, we're doing a graph query. Okay, um, I have uh, if, if it if it helps at some point I can pull up a slide or two. But let's say we're doing a graph query, and we want to find triangles. You know, uh, uh, people that are like I'm connected to you on LinkedIn. You're connected to Ben. Ben is connected to me. That forms a triangle in the graph, or it can be a four click. A triangle is a three click. Uh, you can have like groups of four people that are all connected to each other, groups of five people that are connected to each other. You might want to do that because you want to use that as a feature for fraud detection. You want to find, you know, groups of people who work together to commit fraud, for example. Okay. So they might call each other all the time, you know, and as, as they also call a bunch of other people. Okay. Now, if you wanted to do that in a normal relational database, in order to find all groups of three people, Okay, you would first need to find all groups of two people because if you do, if you join uh, the person table with itself once, okay, say all the people that are connected to other people, you will get a list of every uh, pairwise connection, and then from that you would join it again with persons, or the you know the edge relationship between persons, and then you would then re uh, reduce the list to just the list of people who uh, uh, who are part of a group of three. Okay, so you have to produce a very large intermediate result that you then trim down, okay? But if you do it all simultaneously, you never have to produce that big result and you don't take up uh, uh, all that time, okay? So I don't know if that helped or not, but uh, this idea of eliminating uh, these sort of intermediate results and working with join algorithms that sort of take a pair of tables at a time and work with them is, is foundational to what we do. The other uh, uh, thing that we do, and I probably can't get into it too much today is this idea of semantic optimization where because you have all the semantics about the domain you know that a product for example only has one brand or you know uh, something about the way that um, you know uh, it, uh, an end operation would work you could also take that query written by a, an analyst who doesn't really understand anything about relational or anything about programming or java or anything like that and the system uses the semantics that are in the knowledge graph to simplify the query, to rewrite it into a query that will run much, much, much faster. Okay, so the combination of this new class of work uh, of uh, join algorithms and a new kind of semantic optimization technology automates away programming that you would have had to do by hand in Java or uh, uh, in some other way and lets you work at a very high level of usability without having to give up uh, performance and scalability. So what I'm hearing is is exactly the um, the the proof of your claim earlier in the hour that it's it's new abilities that make relational possible to stick around. So basically, what relational AI has produced is is two pieces, right? One to manage the the performance, the actual uh, fact of finding these elements connected, and then the semantic piece as well, which are the two kinds of pieces that a knowledge <laughs> graph presents. Um, so I guess that's a really good segue into you telling us a little bit more about relational AI and what your thesis as a company is. What, what are you presenting? Okay, so we take sort of these breakthroughs in algorithms and data structures, okay? And we add one more element, which is a really important element. So I mentioned Snowflake earlier. I mentioned uh, systems like BigQuery, okay? These are sort of, there are, uh, there's a, a website that tracks the, the number of databases that exist in the world and something like 800 different databases. Okay, so why is it that seemingly out of nowhere in a very crowded space, a system like Snowflake can come into existence and dominate? Okay, same with BigQuery. Okay, so 
one more, they have the, the innovation that uh, those systems make is that they're architected um, for the cloud, okay? They're not like run on premise and then moved uh, uh, to the cloud so you can run them on the cloud. They don't run on premise. You can't buy BigQuery and run it in your, uh, on your shop, okay? Uh, and what that does is, it, what, what, that, what that lets them do is engineer their systems so that they're really cloud native, which means that you can separate storage. Again, I don't want to get too propeller heady here, but so the cloud is built on, you know, systems like S3 on Amazon, for example, which is sort of infinite storage uh, that lets you uh, basically scale out, uh, uh, you know, your, uh, your data indefinitely from compute, where you basically allocate machines as if you're allocating memory or some other resource. You say, I want three machines, I want 100 machines, I want four machines. So by having that separation, you get database systems that are effectively infinitely uh, scalable. You can have data sets as big as you want, and you can have computes as big as you want. And that's why uh, they became viable for big data workloads, okay? So you could have a system that at the same time is loading data in batch from some data lake or data warehouse, and at the same time loading uh, um, streaming data, uh, trickling data in from other systems, supporting production workloads, uh, supporting uh, analysis workloads, research workloads, one-off workloads, uh, supporting uh, things like uh, zero copy uh, uh, cloning and time travel and versioning. And so uh, I can have uh, developers working off a clone of the system while I'm doing continuous integration, while I'm taking I'm making copies for uh, disaster recovery and, and compliance and, and so on. So those systems is, uh, seem like magic to people who haven't used them before, because before having that kind of architecture, you have to really worry about uh, you know, how you allocate your computing resources. I might have a cluster of 100 machines that has to support all those things at the same time. So I have to be very careful what, what my analyst is, uh, what query my analyst is running while at the same time I'm serving, uh, you know, uh, my fraud detection systems while at the same time I'm loading data and so on. So systems that come with sort of on-premise support, which is every, almost every graph system, uh, and the ones that don't start it off life as on-premise graph systems, don't have that elasticity and don't have that ability to provision infinite storage and infinite compute and to version data and so on. Okay, so that's fundamental to the value proposition of these new uh, databases. Uh, what we've observed though, is that graph databases in general don't do that. I'm not aware of a single graph database that lets you be elastic that way. Even the ones that are offered by you know, the cloud providers, they started out life as a uh, on-premise system. And so they, they carry that baggage with them uh, on the cloud. And, and so our observation is, or our value proposition as a company is that we wanna be the, uh, the pairing to a BigQuery or to a Snowflake for workloads it doesn't support. If you go to their websites and you say, okay, well, what workloads uh, do these kinds of systems support? They'll say, we support data lakes, we support data warehouses, we support data engineering. Uh, we support uh, some element, you know, some fraction of sort of data science, data um, uh, feature engineering type workloads, but they don't say they support graph workloads. They don't say they support reasoning workloads. They don't say they support machine learning workloads, right? And uh, we so we can support those workloads again because we are we have that scalable architecture, that cloud native architecture, in conjunction with these new algorithms and data structures. So. The way that we are positioning ourselves in the market is that we're the, the wine pairing or the pairing that goes with those systems for workloads that are not well supported by those systems. Okay, there's no, no need anymore because those, those guys would all tell you if you want to do graphs, use something else. Or if you want to implement business logic, implement it in Java. Uh, uh, and what we're saying is, no, you can stay relational. We have paradigm compatibility. And then you can stay uh, um, you know, on the cloud or you can be on the cloud in a way that is cloud native so that all those nice things that you have with BigQuery and Snowflake are also exist in your, uh, your graph, uh, your support for graph workloads and reasoning workloads. Um, I hope that made sense. Uh, so our company is just starting. Uh, we are live with uh, 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 a few customers. We haven't, uh, we will be uh, um, starting in limited preview mode uh, here in August in about a week. We're releasing our first uh, preview mode to a select uh, group of customers. I, uh, we're gonna keep working with those customers to find all the points of friction and anything that uh, 
doesn't work great uh, and eliminate that. So, and we'll, we'll do three or four iterations like that. And then hopefully we'll be able to get to GA sometime next year. Uh, if there's anyone on the call that uh, wants to be an early uh, preview client uh, because they're frustrated with all the limitations of the navigational systems that aren't really cloud native, uh, we'd love to talk to you, but we wanna make sure your expectations are set on, uh, on where we are in the journey. So it, it sounds like, you know, we, we're at the very early stage, of course, because this is all very early stage in this industry um, yep. in, in, in your evolution as a company. But what you are, are really looking to do is solve, uh, is complement the market, right? So you have, you know, the, the cloud architecture of, of Snowflake and big query that you were just describing and also relation databases if you want to stay with both, but you still want to do AI and graph work, then you're the, the third candidate for that. So it's right. kind of a opportunity. Um, so, so, you know, I guess uh, I should ask, you know, so I, I know you're, you're very early, but of course there's got to be some experience that uh, relation AI has come from. Um, so, so what kind of clients, you know, uh, use cases have you been able to support what kind of outcomes okay i'll give you an example of um the first application we went live with was in november of last year and it was in a uh, in a domain i can't say too much about the details but it was in a domain where um it was in financial services slash uh tax uh where uh the the system that we were building was intended to match um transactions. So if you're the kind of company that buys a lot of stocks, you buy and sell a lot of stocks, let's say your hedge fund or a quant, and um, you, know, you might buy the same stock, you know, 100 times, and you might sell it 50 times. And the way that you match those transactions can have, uh, you know, um, the way that you do that can have a big impact on sort of profitability of those transactions from a tax perspective or from other perspectives. And uh, these folks had um, a legacy system that was on premise built with uh, C-sharp, about 800,000 lines of C-sharp and some SQL, but most of the business logic was written in C-sharp. And uh, they wanted to modernize. They wanted to move that technology to the cloud, but they didn't want to make the mistake of just taking the same old stuff and just running on the cloud, right? That's, uh, uh, you know, that doesn't really get you anything. Uh, in some cases, it's even maybe a step back. So they really wanted to take advantage of the elasticity of the cloud and they wanted to take advantage of modern architectures and sort of the sort of data-centric architectures and, and, and so on. So what we did is we, uh, we spent a few months working with them to just understand the requir their requirements. And in about three months of knowledge engineering, uh, we were able to take that system and instead of representing the logic uh, uh, you know, in imperative code, we represented, we reformulated a sort of a reasoning problem and wrote uh, the logic sort of uh, relationally. And instead of 800,000 lines of imperative code, procedural code, it became about 12,000 lines of a relational model, okay? And you can imagine what that means. It means now, first of all, because it's relational, all their analysts and their, uh, the folks that know how to use SQL all of a sudden now understand that stuff. They might not always be able to write it, but they certainly can read it and they can tell you what's, uh, what's wrong with it. Uh, second of all, because we have all this scalability and relational machinery, we took workloads that they just couldn't handle in the all system. They'd had to split the data into smaller and smaller pieces and run it sort of in, in a stitched up way and we can just run them all the way through. So we gave them something much more scalable. Uh, and we're able to, because the model is so compact, we're able to add features that allowed them to be more competitive in the marketplace, things that would have been much harder to add uh, to a bunch of procedural code uh, like, uh, like C-sharp or Java. So, um, and I really, really cool, like there was a part of the system, about 100,000 lines that uh, became seven pages of uh, knowledge graph, okay? And it's seven pages that I'm sure everyone on this call, we can sit down together and we can read it together. It might take us, you know, a few hours, but by the end of the few hours, we will all understand what's in there, what the system does and what it doesn't do. And we've sort of surfaced the knowledge, the essential complexity of the problem without having to carry all that accidental complexity about how do you program it and memory management and parallelization and, and concurrency and all of that stuff that really doesn't matter to a business person because all they care about is sort of the, the knowledge that represents the problem they're trying to solve. So that's my, my our first example. It's my favorite example as well. Um, before doing this at Relational AI, we had, we had experience in, in a company that we built and sold uh, uh, where we, uh, we also developed a lot of systems like this for uh, retailers and so on. So it's not our first rodeo. 
And, uh, but this time around, we're gonna do it sort of uh, with a focus on getting the knowledge graph management system itself out there uh, for people to use instead of what we did before, which is build it for us to, to, us to use internally uh, and build uh, solutions on top of it. So I, I'm just, I mean, so that sounds fantastic. And I'm just really curious about what a page of knowledge graph looks like. Like, is it literally like graph statements written out or? I can show you, I can show you. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I can screen yeah, share yeah. that. Yeah. Excellent. All right, you should be able to share. Go ahead. Okay, let's take a quick look. All right, so I'm going to stay. Uh, okay. Okay, so this was sort of the overview of the problem. Uh, securities transaction matching, I wanted to modernize and the approach was um, cloud native knowledge graphs, relational knowledge graphs. Okay, so the knowledge graph, you know, you can model the so in, in their in their world, the concept of a sublot represents a, a set of securities that you buy or sell together. And you might have an integrity constraint here that says, you know, uh, uh, a sublot uh, uh, splits from another sublot implies that uh, the uh, split quantity of the of the split is smaller than the, the thing that you're that you're splitting from. Okay, you, you know, the syntax might not seem too familiar to you, but it's basically, you write basically what you know. This implies that, uh, this implies that. If uh, you split sublot S, that implies that you're either splitting it as a long or a short. Again, this is the terminology of the domain here about, you know, trading in equities. Are you doing it in a long, uh, long trade or a short trade? And here you're saying if, uh, if a sublot is long, it implies that it's not short. Okay, and this business logic can be also captured in this kind of uh, diagrammatic notation, uh, these integrity constraints where you can sort of relate uh, concepts to each other. And this, instead of just having a plain old line connecting two uh, nodes in the graph, we actually model out the relation. And so this box here says this is a relationship that has two parts, an input sublot and a split sublot. Uh, this um, a vi a violet or purple dot says that this is mandatory that every split, split sublot come from an input sub sublot and it only has one of those. Okay, so again, it's not going to make sense to you uh, uh, the first time you see it right away, but intuitively you should see that this is taking this, this, this concept in this domain and representing them um, uh, uh, relationally with these sort of skinny relations. Uh, and then just one more quick example, uh, you can then flesh out the rules where you can say, Hey, a, uh, an available, a sublot is available on the start day, and that's equal to, you know, uh, you know when it opens, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I don't know the domain here, okay? And so, but what I would like to highlight is this sort of available start of relationship depends on, opens on, available start of relationship also depends on available end of and closes on, okay? And then available start of is also depends on uh, available uh, the end of, okay? So what, what this is saying is I, I'm defining the, uh, you know, how something can be available at the start of a day. I'm also defining how it can be def uh, defined at the end of, uh, how it's available at the end of a day. And notice something is available at the end of a day depends on something being available at the start of the day and not being hedged. So available at start of depends on available at end of, and available at end of depends on available at start of. So you have a recursive definition, okay? And, uh, and then available at end of depends on uh, not hedging on, and hedging on depends on available at start of. So you have now three or four things that depend on each other. I can read any one of these lines to the domain expert and it will make sense to them, but all together, they represent a, uh, a, a set of interrelated or interdependent relationships, okay? And our system just takes all of that and automatically creates a, a non-trivial execution graph connecting all of these definitions, all these bits of knowledge together, uh, and then executes this and gives you the right answer. And the seven pages, I kind of printed them out here in a little blurry because this is we don't want to share our you know detailed uh, uh, information here. Uh, but there are basically these are the seven pages of just rules like that. Like what does it mean to be available on a day? What does it mean to be available at the beginning of the day? At the end of the day? What does it mean to hedge? You just write them all out, and here are your seven pages that replaced about a hundred thousand lines of C sharp. 
that make sense? Yeah. So, so it, the knowledge management software that you're talking about, is this an, an automatic production? Like if you put this code in, then you just get this thing popped out? Exactly. The model is the program. You see, we're automating away programming, right? You just write your model and it's, it's the program, right? That's what SQL gives us for other things, right? For OLTP workloads, you don't have to worry about programming a SQL query that says, you know, give me all the customers that live in the in Northeast that bought more than three things from me in the last two months. Mm -hmm. Just ask the question, SQL gives you the answer, right? Uh, and it does that by, you know, doing a query optimization and looking at the data and trying to understand the best way to answer that question. You know, do I start with people living in the Northeast or do I start with people who bought, you know, uh, three things or more or uh, the people who bought some, something from me in the last three months? SQL figures all that for you. You don't have to program it. When you have business logic, people don't write it typically in, in a relational language. And so they will then write Java code or C-sharp code to do all that stuff. And that's way more work than is necessary if you have the right kind of uh, knowledge graph management system, relational knowledge graph management system. Interesting. I, I could ask you a lot of questions about this because modeling interconnected relationships is, is kind of the uh, missing piece for sustainability, which is my domain background. Uh, but I, I think that that the, the first problem in that domain is that the information is not in SQL. <laughs> it's buried in academic texts and, you know, who knows where, what other kind of data? Yeah, great, great question. Actually, um, knowledge graph creation, sorry to interrupt, but I'm excited. No, about your go question. ahead. Yes. So, first of all, we are actually, we have a knowledge graphs for good initiative and we're, uh, we're working with uh, two non nonprofit-ish uh, groups. Uh, one uh, to bring fairness into consumer credit lending, an organization called FinRag Labs. And you can look them up and you can see, you can read about the work we're doing there. But the other is United Nations and the United Nations is very interested in sustainability since you mentioned uh, sustainability, okay? And so if you have a, a cause that you care about that we can help you with with our knowledge graph management uh, system, we'd love to uh, connect with me and we'll, 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 we'll see if we can help, okay? Uh, uh, but the other, the other sort of work, another work, another track of work we're doing um, with you know, commercial uh, venture is in financial services, where folks are have lots and lots of uh, knowledge embedded in PDFs, okay, in PDFs that represent contracts, mm -hmm. uh, and they want to be able to extract that knowledge and make it executable, right? So if I loan, uh, I'm in an organization, I loan you know Facebook a billion dollars. I usually put restrictions on what Facebook uh, and covenants on, you know, how they have to behave in order to continue to have that money, right? Uh, and all of that stuff gets written down in English, puts in, you know, in, con in contracts that you know, are converted into PDFs and that are opaque um, to, you know, uh, to any machine. And so a big part of the challenge for us is, and for using one of the opportunities slash challenges with knowledge graphs is how do you take knowledge uh, from text or from images or from uh, audio sources or from video uh, or from source code, you know, where you have a lot of knowledge embedded in source code. These are complex uh, uh, data sources, right? Sometimes people call them unstructured, but I think it, it's sort of, it's harder than that. It's really, they're unstructured and very complex, but they encode a lot of knowledge that right now is hidden from our systems, from our machinery. So um, what's cool about uh, sort of the interplay here is that knowledge graphs can really help you with machine learning and AI, but knowledge graph construction uh, can only, uh, can, use, can in a lot of cases only happen with the help of machine learning and AI. So Google's knowledge graph is built by them basically crawling the web with all the text and all of that, the, the, that kind of data. And they use machine learning to extract that knowledge to create the, the Google knowledge graph. So when you Google, uh, you know, um, your favorite actor, your favorite scientist, or your favorite business person, or your favorite city, you'll get that panel on the right of the web page that'll give you structured information about that. Well, that's a query from the Google Knowledge Graph. Uh, when you uh, talk to Siri, and you ask Siri, what's the weather like outside? It actually is querying, it's taking your question and querying the Apple and Siri Knowledge Graph. Uh, Amazon has a product knowledge graph so all of those knowledge, graph, knowledge, knowledge graphs cannot be constructed by hand. They have to be constructed in a semi-automated way, at least. And uh, machine learning uh, plays a big part in, the, in that. And, uh, and of course, text uh, uh, is a very, very important source uh, of, uh, of knowledge. Yes, that's how we've been recording it for, you know, just a few thousand yes. years yeah. so far. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, so, so last question, you know, I would love to go on to that, but I know we have lots of questions. So just one last question for you. Um, do you see one day, you mentioned the Amazon product graph and the Google knowledge graph. Do you see relational being the backbone of those one day in the future? <laughs> Well, yeah, it would be great. Uh, but so the issue and what's more important for, for me and for us at Relational AI is to make that technology available to everyone else, right? Like, so Google has its own knowledge graph management technology internally. You can't buy it really. Uh, Amazon, same. Uh, Apple, same. Uh, Facebook has their own knowledge graph, same. Microsoft uh, has uh, 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 multiple knowledge graphs. Uh, they have the one behind Bing. It's called the Satori Knowledge Graph. They have one behind Office 365, believe it or not, because it's all online now. And of course, they have one behind LinkedIn. They call it the uh, Economic uh, Graph. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in hearing from someone else who believes the future is relational, the future of graphs is relational, I would recommend that you look up uh, or, or Google uh, Liquid, uh, LinkedIn Liquid. There are a couple of blog articles written by the folks who built that system, who, by the way, use some of the algorithms we invented. Uh, and they give us credit in those blogs um, to talk about why they believe that knowledge graphs will be relational. So it's, there's actually two, two blogs, blog, first and second blog on liquid. So, um, so unfortunately, those systems are not available to the masses. And what we want to do is actually provide the same kind of machinery uh, to, to everybody, whether it's a personal knowledge graph or whether it's an enterprise that wants to deploy knowledge graphs to, to deal with these workloads that right now aren't dealt with in a database system or in a, you know, in a scalable, let's say, database system. Uh, and to take, to take it out of code, if you think about how much code we write as a, as a species, uh, really, is, is, you know, I, I'd say it was a, more than half of the work, computing workloads out there are in code, not, in, uh, not as database queries. And all of that now becomes uh, workloads. All those, all those programs become workloads that one, you can sort of make reasoning workloads. You can transfer that code into just declarative statements, relational uh, statements. And then you can run that inside a database system that will automate away uh, all the things you have to do when you program, or many of them. Somewhere, I think, you know, in the, the last two minutes, there's a couple of like really good marketing phrases for, for your relational AI, right? Like, like bringing the king's knowledge graphs to everyone else and then yeah. something too about the, the structure that you just outlined. But, but again, we could go on forever, but I know folks want to ask questions. So I'm, I'm going to start with this one from Jeffrey that came in a, a, a little bit ago. Um, so he's asking, are you, Moham, are you suggesting knowledge graphs as a scaffolding that sits atop existing relational databases. Why not store all the data in flat files, which is high performance, as triples and properties, which would allow for faster listening into KGs and expedited searches for virtual joins with your algorithm? Uh, look, you, you know, this a, it's a reasonable uh, uh, alternative architecture. So let me show you here something, if I can just... Uh, so when I say we, you know, we pair, uh, this is what I mean. Like, so folks have these sort of cloud uh, databases that be used for data lakes and data engineering and, and data sharing and so on. Um, Databricks, as it sort of pivots away from, you know, we're map reduced on better to we're actually a SQL database. Uh, they've come up with some really nice ideas about uh, that sound like, uh, uh, like, you know, what the, what the, what the, what the uh, who was it that asked the question? Sorry. Uh, uh, what what the question ask uh, asker uh, means right keep, keep your data in in files keep it in parquet keep it in in something like that and then query against that but those systems uh, still uh, um, you know will will support uh, these types of workloads okay I don't I believe we can you know we can we can architect in a, in a very similar way. And whether the data is uh, in our format or is in some other format, uh, probably has some performance implications. But the architecture that's being proposed here is a reasonable one, if I understood the question correctly, at least. So there are alternative routes to kind of towards the same direction. So Jeff, we're, yep, great, we're on the same page. Um, does anyone else have another question? You can drop it in the chat or you can also turn on your mic and speak with Moham directly. I'll throw out a question if you don't mind. For some Great. reason, you mentioned brands twice. Um, and I'm wondering why you do that. You said every product has a brand. 
And just out of curiosity, I'm going through an Excel file of 140,000 names, going through all the brands. And most of the time, it is true, there's one. But you can have something like uh, Doritos Hots or something, the Flaming Hots, which has two brands in it. So I was just curious, one, does Excel, oh. is Excel relational? And two, why did you happen to mention that twice? Oh, I was just trying to come up with an example that we would, I, I thought we would all agree on. And generally, I mean, you're right, the brands have sub-brands and so on. And we can model that, and that can be modeled relationally very easily, right? But uh, at sort of the level of uh, detail I was operating uh, on, you know, like an Apple iPhone, or sorry, an iPhone is an Apple. It's not a Galaxy, uh, or it's not a Samsung, or it's not a, a Google, uh, and, uh, and so on. That's sort of the level at which I was operating. If in your model... You have brand, you know, primary brand and sub brands and so on. You can model that as well. You can have a many to many relationship, and that would be uh, useful, uh, useful knowledge that you would want to actually be aware of. You want the system to be aware of. So, so that was why I used that example. I was just trying to find something that we all relate to, something that not like equities uh, matching, right? We all shop, we all have products, we all know about brands. Uh, and when so, you mention relational, I always hear you say SQL after that. As a dumb Excel user, is Excel relational or that doesn't even count? Uh, Excel has elements of relational. Uh, Excel is really, I think, a functional, almost functional language. It is, it is uh, not fully relational in the sense that it doesn't let you, it's not as expressive in many ways uh, as uh, the relational model can be. Uh, but it is tabular. Uh, it is sort of based on this matrix representation. Um, I don't think Accident it's really accidentally, if I could say 34 years ago, I started a database. I didn't know what a triple was, but they're triples. Yeah, there are relations. There are <laughs> tables with three columns. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. And then there with, with that kind of architecture, you basically have to do a lot of self joins. You join that triple with itself over and over and over again. And SQL systems are not well designed for that. And that's why people found uh, they had to sort of invent other technologies to try to deal with these triples because SQL systems don't do self-joins very well. Uh, so the point I guess I, I could have made more clearly in this discussion is SQL is a language that is based on the relational paradigm. But SQL is just one, you know, 40-year-old uh, representation of that. I like SQL. I think SQL is great. I think SQL has made computing accessible to a lot of people. But SQL is 40 years old. Like you can improve on SQL. Uh, you can certainly make it more modular. You can, there's so many things that you can make, uh, you can do to SQL to make it more accessible. My point of view on this is I'm not here to tell you SQL is good or bad. You, uh, you have your points of view on it. Uh, but I am here to say, sorry. I really have no point of view on SQL. I just as a business person, and a lot of what you say is over my head, I just like the idea of using Excel and then giving it to a company called Semantic Arts, which puts it into Allograph or whatever it is. But, yeah. but they seem to work together, or do you say Excel don't even think about that as data input to relational knowledge graphs? No, I think Excel has a place, of course. I just think that a lot of um, what Excel does could be done um, um, in a more scalable way in conjunction with relational technology. So I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Dave uh, and Semantic Arts, uh, by the way, I've read the software wasteland books and uh, uh, data-centric programming or data-centric architecture. He, in, some, in many ways, he's making the same points. He talks about two and $3 trillion of waste in our industry in large part because we don't have the, the sort of ability to represent knowledge the right way. And, and, and we, we end up coding these applications with the SQL database. But really the, the problem is that you have a lot of knowledge embedded in code. Uh, and uh, and you, if you take that code and you actually make it, you know, relational knowledge that you can uh, you can simplify things and you can eliminate you know a lot of this waste that Dave is talking about. So uh, if you're a fan of their their of his work, I think you would enjoy um, learning more about what we're doing. Yes, thank you. That's yeah. I mean, that's another question that I would have liked to ask. And I mean, we're, we're at five minutes, so, you know, maybe just a point now, but, but th there's this conversation that happens inside of the graph community around transitioning, right? Transitioning our whole data paradigm so that it's not as wasteful or as siloed. And, and Dave is, you know, certainly one of the most prominent voices around that, but there's also others like Mike Atkin, who's been joining me for the last couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of the question that I had, like, your approach with relational m means that 
it doesn't require a wholesale infrastructural transformation, right, to actually move into a different kind of data management. Um, do you think that's a, a benefit? For example, like it's it's less costly for firms and, and less challenging to make that choice. Um, but also, or on the other side, is it a challenge because in fact, it's not a transformation. So, you know, maybe bad practices can can still continue. Yeah, so a great point. And actually, Dave and I spoke about this. So my, my, my perspective is yeah, we can, you know, we can have uh, missionary zeal and so on. But what, we, what we, we really all like is the graph paradigm, the model, okay? I don't think anyone here cares whether the model is implemented with pointers or with some other low-level technique, right? What we really like is this highly normalized uh, um, model, modeling technology, modeling technique that lets you represent relationships between concepts and, and just that. You don't, we don't like... Uh, you know, wide tables that have a person and 50 things that, that you know, uh, pertain to that, to that person, right? And my view is instead of, uh, you know, telling everyone that they're morons, uh, then we just build, you know, we meet them where they are. They're obviously very comfortable with uh, relational technology, right? Um, and and, and uh, I, think, I think it's also fair to say that the uh, navigational graph technologies out there haven't served us well as a community because they're so limited in so many ways. Their query languages are limited, their, uh, uh, their performance is limited, their scalability is limited, right? Like, yeah, we like them because they, they, they endorse the graph model that we all like, but their implementations aren't really that, that good, okay? So if we can get like a grown-up implementation that has the same architecture as these sort of uh, widely deployed systems, and we can go into large enterprises and, you know, behave like responsible adults from a technology perspective, right? As opposed to being, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, hand wavy about how to make all of this stuff practical. I think uh, we can make graph technology much more popular because it is better. It is a, the graph paradigm as a model is much better than these sort of less normalized alternatives. And uh, we just need the right kind of infrastructure to run it on. Absolutely, yeah, and and I'm just one last question. So, do you find that the the graph model is easier for executives maybe to grasp? Like, is that the problem them actually grasping graph thinking, or is it the no, rest of I, the you know the challenge? No, I, I don't think it's hard. I think it's easier. Like, what yield is basically with concepts and relationship between concepts. It's it's sort of the that's that mm -hmm. kind of conceptual modeling is the highest level of abstraction that we've been able to come up with as a society or as a community, right? Everything is uh, a translation of that to something more and more, uh, um, com you know, complex. Uh, so I think the model, the abstractions are beautiful. I just think they've been, you know, it's a false choice to say in order to have the model, you have to have navigation. Right. No, you can have the model and you can keep all your relational machinery as long as you have the right relational algorithms and data structures that support that model, that let you go fast and let you scale without having to chase pointers around uh, in code. Exactly, yep, that, that absolutely makes sense. Um, so we'll wrap up there, we're at time. This has been a really fantastic uh, conversation. Thank you, Malham, so much. I've received comments that you've blown the minds of guests here. So <laughs> I would say that's a success. Um, and then, of course, and then one last thing before I let you go, in fact, um, Sarah Banks was asking if she could receive a copy of these slides. Would you like to share yeah. those? Reach out to info at relational.ai. Uh, and I would love, would love to engage with this presentation and, uh, and other content. Like, I, you know, we're just scratching the surface here. Uh, so yeah, please reach out to info at relational.ai and we'd be very happy to follow up. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure, as I said, and I'm excited to, to know more about uh, this whole perspective, this new perspective that you're presenting. I'm going to look for those, like, those LinkedIn link LinkedIn liquid blog posts. So I'll be yep. sharing this on my LinkedIn for anyone else who's curious. Um, so thank you, Mom. Have a great day. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate everyone's time. Thanks. Bye-bye.